Hey, good morning, everybody. We're really glad you're here this morning. Uh, I need to speak to you before I begin the message about some events of this past week. Uh, Many of you are aware that a member of our church uh, was arrested this week on the charge of sending an obscene text to a minor who also attended our church. Our church staff first became aware of this on September 1st, and we took immediate steps to eliminate any contact this person would have with students and children. We have reached out to those who are directly involved to express our care and to pray for them. Now, this past Wednesday, the individual accused of this crime surrendered to authorities and was arrested. On Friday... The Sheriff's Department posted on their Facebook page a picture of the accused and the details of the charges. They also posted incorrect information that the accused was a youth pastor at Alice Drive. This is not true. This person has never been employed by Alice Drive and has never served as a youth pastor. It is true that the person arrested served as a deacon and resigned early last week from being a deacon here. We did contact the Sheriff's Department uh, in order to correct the misinformation, but we have no control over what the Sheriff's Department posts or does not post on their website and on their Facebook page. When this news became public, there was a aggressive response on social media We have elected not to respond to the allegations on social media other than one statement that I have made because we are living by Jesus' command to let our yes be yes and our no be no. At Alice Drive, we take the safety of our children and students seriously. Our staff, our paid employees, are all required to submit to a background check before employment to reveal anything that might disqualify them from being around children under the age of 18. Likewise, our volunteers voluntarily submit to the same background check to reveal anything that might disqualify them. At Alice Drive, we deplore and we will not tolerate any conduct by any member that inflicts emotional, physical, or spiritual harm on a child or student. Jesus told us it is better to tie a millstone around our neck and cast ourselves into the sea rather than harm any of these little ones. And we take that seriously. Now we are a place of grace. So we will love and care for and pray for all who have been harmed by this event. I want to ask you now to join me in prayer for both the person involved as the victim, because no child should ever have to deal with anything like this. I want to ask you please also to pray for the accused and to pray for our church. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, there is evil in this world because you gave us the responsibility of free choice and sometimes we choose the wrong things. And then sometimes, Father, people around us choose to do the wrong things and harm is done. So I begin by praying for the victim and ask God that you would surround this person with your care. May they know your deep and profound love. May this not interfere with their relationship with you. And I pray for the victim's parents they would have much wisdom and that they would know how properly to love and care for their child. I pray for the accused that you might work in his life and may he have both a spirit of humility and repentance. May you also, God, work to bring healing to whatever hurt there is in his soul that has caused this. Because we know all crime, all sin, begins with the hurt of our own souls. 
I know you will protect your church. You've done so for thousands of years. But it is us who are in the storm right now. And we put this church, your church, in your care and ask for you to guide us and give us strength and help us not to take our eyes off Jesus lest we sink into the waves of daily troubles. Now bless us as we hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, we are starting a new series about growing character, and it's very timely because your character is going to be stress test. The character of a church can be stress test. And we are going to base this new series about growing character on Philippians 4. So if you have a Bible, you might want to go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 4. And this is such a rich passage, we're just going to take it almost line at a time. It's so, so rich. And this part of Paul's epistle to the church at Philippi, it, it really gives us this recipe, this roadmap for how to grow our character but the first thing that Paul tells us to do is to be joyful. And so Friday, as all of this was breaking and as all of this began to occur and we began to have to figure out our response, it dawned on me that I'm supposed to preach about joy today. And I thought, well, that's not real good. I mean, this is heavy and I don't think I should preach about joy. And I prayed about it. I said, God, what would you want me to preach? Now, I don't hear God audibly um, but I did have this very strong impression, preach on joy. I wish I could tell you I had the faith to simply say, yes, Lord, your servant hears, but I argued with God and I said, are you sure? Have you ever thought about how ridiculous it is to ask God if he's sure? And it came back, yes, preach about joy. Because I think this is exactly the kind of moment that we need to understand what joy really is. So what is joy? Dallas Willard, a Christian philosopher, said this, joy is a deep sense of well-being, of safety in God's universe. Now, that leads me to want to ask all of us this question, how joyous are you? Now, let's be clear, joy is different than happiness. Happiness is a moment. It usually centers around ourselves. It is situational. You can be very happy that your team scored a touchdown. So Clemson and Carolina fans are very, very happy today. But you can find joy in tough times. Coach John West was a coach at Furman, and he said, the joy of my life is not dependent on the circumstances of my life. So as we look at this one verse that Paul gives us, it is so rich and so profound, and yet it's very short. And I want you to memorize this verse. I know some of you say, I cannot memorize scripture. You can memorize this verse. And the verse is Philippians chapter four, verse four. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Would you read that with me? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Okay, now close your eyes. Okay, I'm looking at you and some of you are not closing your eyes. Now say it with me, really? Are you ready? Let's go. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. You just memorized a whole verse of scripture. Isn't this great? You can open your eyes now. Let me give you some background on this. When Paul wrote it, he was under house arrest. He was chained to a Roman guard. Now Paul had appealed to the Roman emperor because he felt like he was being wrongly convicted of a crime. And Roman citizens had the right to appeal to the emperor. Here's the problem, the emperor was Nero. Nero was nuts. If you don't know that, read history. This is the guy who set Christians on fire to light his garden. He thought that their screams were amusing. He was sick. And Paul has to go before this nut job of an emperor and the emperor can literally say, yeah, let him go, or no, kill him. And he's crazy. Would you trust your fate to a crazy man? And how can Paul, in this circumstances, say, 
rejoice. And, and, and what Paul says rejoice, it's not a suggestion. It is a command. It's a Greek form, which is a command. So it is not, hey, here's a good idea, rejoice. It is rejoice, and our response should be, yes, sir. He's telling us that joy is the default setting for Jesus followers. Now, this makes me squirm. It makes me squirm for two reasons. The first is I have been to many churches in my life, and it often feels like when I have gone to church, joy has left the building. I have been in churches that sing joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. I mean, there is no joy in those words. And I have been to churches where it seems like the preacher is just mad. Have you been to those churches? Where the preacher stands up and says, you are sinners, you better turn or you're going to burn. You better get sanctified or you're going to be french fried. A little scary how easy that comes to me. And there's no joy. You can't wait to get out of there. So we don't do very well at this as churches. And here's the second reason why it makes me squirm. By nature, I am not a joyful person. I can be overly skeptical of people. I can uh, tend to look on the dark side. There's some reasons for this. And so when Paul says rejoice and it's a command, I want to say, wait a minute, Paul, do you know what I've been dealing with this week? Do you know what my life has been like, Paul? And you tell me to rejoice? Sure. And then I remember he's under house arrest, chained to a Roman soldier. Do you realize that means everything he does from eating to taking care of personal needs He's got a soldier right there with him. Oh yeah, rejoice. Maybe you feel that way. Maybe you wanna say, okay, yeah, I get it. We're supposed to rejoice, but somebody I love's got cancer. Hey, yeah, I know we're supposed to rejoice, but I have three preschoolers under the age of four. I don't have time to rejoice. Maybe it is, hey, I am old and I hurt and I'm cranky and I'm not gonna rejoice. Or maybe it's even, I am sick and tired of cleaning up after somebody else's mess. I don't want to rejoice. Okay, this is all, understand, all understandable, and it's actually understood by your heavenly Father, and yet he commands you to rejoice. So how can Paul command this? Well, the Greek word for joy is kairos. A variation of this word we translate as grace. Joy and grace intertwine. You see, grace is receiving a gift you don't deserve. Joy is your response to receiving that gift. Have you ever gotten a Christmas gift that surprised you and you didn't deserve it? And what was your expression? Were you mad about it? Did you break into tears? Or did you have joy? See, the key to having a joyful character, Paul says, is to rejoice in the Lord, which means you center your life in Jesus Christ. Happiness can come and go, but it's primarily about yourself. Joy means living in the awareness of all the good, all the grace that God is doing for you all the time. And Paul uses the word always. Again, he's telling us this is the default setting for believers. So let's just explore this idea a little bit. Is there grace that can help you rejoice? There's an old hymn, count your many blessings, name them one by one. So let's start with some blessings maybe you ought to count. Maybe it'll help you discover some of God's grace in your life. God didn't have to give you the gift of life, but he did. God did not have to bless you with a world that sustains life where food can be found, where there's oxygen to, to breathe, but he did. God did not have to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins so you could have a relationship with him, but God did. God did not have to raise his son on the third day so you could have power for a different life, but he did. All of that is grace. God didn't have to make food taste good, but he did. But what about the hard times? I, I, there's a line from a song, and I can't remember the name of the song, but the line goes like this. I'll never forget it. When you can't see his hand, trust his heart. Because you see, the, the God who's done good things for you in the past, do you think he changes just because something 
bad is happening to you? Isn't it possible that the same God who saw you through tough times can see you through tough times now? So look for grace. To rejoice in the Lord also means that you rest in God's love. Now what does that mean? Uh, at our old house, uh, we put in a pool when the kids were getting to be teenagers because we wanted everybody to come to our house, and they did. And when I would do the yard work, I did all my yard, yard work, I would, I would cut the grass, I'd get all that yard dust all over me, you know, you know what that is? And you would do all the hedge work, and you'd cut, and uh, you'd, you'd do the edging, all that kind of stuff you would do, and I would just get hot and sweaty, every part of me would be wet with sweat, and I'd be overheated, you know what, you know what I'm talking about? Have you stepped outside the last few weeks? And when I was finally done, I'd put up the lawnmower and put up all the tools, I would run around to the back of the house and I would jump fully clothed with my shoes on into the pool. And that moment when you hit the water, there's just this sense of, oh. Everything in you that is overheated is getting cooled down. I ruined two cell phones that way. Has your soul gotten overheated? Your stress will overheat your soul. Anxiety will overheat your soul. All kind of things. Maybe your soul's gotten overheated because you are depressed or just worn out. Well, rest in God's love. Yes, there are maybe medication you need to take, but, but for all of us, take a moment and actually rest in the love of God and let him cool down your overheated soul. Rest in the knowledge of his forgiveness of how much he loves you. To rejoice means that you walk in hope. We talked about hope a lot last year. That was our theme. You may remember our memory verse. I hope you did. Romans 15, 13. And it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. What we want is to have the power of the Holy Spirit so present in our lives that hope just blooms. It means whatever troubles you now doesn't have the last word. Jesus does. And this is so easy to forget because this is what I do. I get so focused on the problem, I'm just right down here in it, and I forget to look up and go, oh, wait a minute. God's at work. Good things are happening. This problem is not the whole world. It's not even my whole world. I forget that. And that's why I need to remind myself that I serve a God of hope. I want to show you a picture of one of my heroes, a man named Bill Wallace. He was a medical missionary in China before World War II, during World War II, and after World War II in the city of Wuchow. Um, as the Japanese army advanced and the Chinese army retreated, uh, they came to the city of Wuchow, and Bill, as a white American, could very easily have gotten out of there, and no one would have thought the less of him. But Bill was dedicated to his patients because he loved Jesus, and so he arranged to rent a barge and a tow, and he moved the entire hospital from a physical building to a barge. They erected awnings over the barge. They put the patients on the barge, as much medical equipment as they could move, all of the Chinese staff, all of the nurses, and all of the doctors. And they begin to push up river away from the Japanese army. The Japanese army continued to advance. The Chinese army confiscated the tow. And now Bill and other male members of the staff harness themselves to the barge, just as in the olden days, and pull that barge physically up the river. Dysentery and disease broke out, you can imagine. At times, food was scarce. One of the nurses remembered that Bill would make sure the patients were fed first, and then the staff was fed second, and he would take what was left over. She said she saw him one night picking up the burnt kernels of rice that no one else would eat. That was his only meal for the day. But Bill would go around and remind people that they were in God's care, that they had a mission, they were not to give up. 
One of the nurses said, whenever we were at the point of despair, Bill would remind us that God loved us, was working through us, and that God would see us through. And after uh, almost a year of being refugees, they came back to Wu Chow. The Chinese had retaken the city, and they had lost not a patient, not a staff member. Bill's hope was in Jesus, not in his medical skill, not in his mechanical ability. It was in Jesus. To rejoice so means that you have grace and love and hope, but it also means that you have deep peace. And this is our theme for this year, our memory verse, John 14, 27. Would you say it with me? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives, do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus makes peace between us and God through his death on the cross. Jesus brings us peace in our soul through the power of his resurrection. Guilt no longer reigns. Satan's words to you when he tries to convince you that you're not worthy, it loses their power because you are not threatened with the approval or disapproval of other people. Your peace depends upon Jesus. Now, maybe this diagram will help you understand. When you rest in the love of God, and when you can see the grace of God at work in your life, and when you put your hope in Jesus, and when that deep peace comes into your life, joy is the result. Now, what blocks joy? Well, joy can be blocked because of attachment wounds. Uh, counselors will tell you attachment wounds or, or when you don't have a strong, secure attachment with significant people in your life, particularly in childhood if you don't have that strong attachment with parents. That can be a block to having joy in your life. And, and I do want to say maybe the most confrontational thing that some of you, the reason you don't have much joy in your life is because you are neglecting having a strong relationship with our Heavenly Father. You think that that will just happen and you don't put any effort into it. That's why we encourage you to grow your character because the stronger your connection is with your Heavenly Father, the more you will be able to experience the love, grace, hope, peace which will result in joy in your life. You know, if you hang on to past failures, if you live in guilt and shame, joy might be difficult for you and you can torture yourself feeling like a failure. And this can be hard for Christians because we, we acknowledge we're failures, right? We acknowledge we're sinners. But let's remember, God didn't want us to just acknowledge we're sinners. He wants us to acknowledge we're sinners so we can deal in reality. And so then we can be people who know that we are loved and forgiven. Circumstances can block joy. You can be overwhelmed. You can be flooded. You can have so many emotions you can't sort them out. Sometimes you create the circumstances that flood you. Sometimes somebody else creates them for you. And you wind up just focusing on your problems. Lift up your heads. The psalmist says, I look to the hills. From whence does my help come? It comes from the Lord, maker of creator and earth. Folks, if you just focus on what is wrong with your life, what's wrong with relationships, it's hard to find much joy. Some of you may have a natural temperament toward what Charles Erdman called the dark view of life. I have this, I've shared this with you. Erdman said, some people have a genius for joy, others have a dark view of life. This comes from a lot of sources. You may have high skepticism. You may have been betrayed by people that you trusted. You may have had a life experience like cancer or post traumatic stress disorder, chronic disease, a cancer, all of these things can block joy and cause you to have a dark view of life. But can you be joyful even if you have these blockages? The answer is yes. Remember Paul? Chained to a guard? Under house arrest? Subject 
to the whim of a crazy man? Now, does this mean we can't be sad? There was an older woman in our church who had lost her husband, and she said to me, I know I shouldn't be sad that he's gone. And I hugged her, and I said, of course you would be sad. You had a good marriage. You need to grieve. But you're not grieving as somebody without hope. Now, this is very paradoxical. And I'm I'm, I'm telling you this, but I want you to know I'm not good at this. The reason some of us don't have joy is because we won't let ourselves be sad. See, you can't selectively pick which emotion you're going to numb. You numb one, you numb all. And so some of you need to let yourself just feel sad and just feel it. And you will be amazed at the joy that will come and the peace that will come and the grace that will come after you feel the sadness. I love Dallas's words. Joy is feeling safe. You know, God does not promise to keep us from trouble. I wish he did. There are several troubles I would like to present to God and say, would you keep me from this? Or keep this out of my life? Or this has come into my life. Would you just get rid of it? That prayer has never been answered. What God does promise is that he will be my ultimate safety that my security is in him. I want to say this as clearly as I can. Ultimate safety is not found in how many guns you have or electing the right politicians or in retreating from the world and numbing out. Ultimate safety is found in the loving arms of your heavenly father. So how do you grow joy? I want to give you just some real practical, basic things you can do. You might want to write these down. First of all, you can pray this very simple prayer. Heavenly Father, open my eyes to joy. And this is a variation of a prayer I encourage you to pray daily, which is, Heavenly Father, help me see your hand at work in small ways and large ways. You can modify that to say, help me see joy. Now, I've already told you I, have, I, I tend toward the darker view, so this is a struggle for me. So Todd and I were traveling recently to Tupelo, Mississippi to meet with some like-minded churches, And we got there early. We left Sumter at 5 o'clock. We get to Tupelo at about 10.30. Our meeting starts at 12. We've got nothing to do in Tupelo for an hour and a half. And you can only stand at Elvis' birthplace so long. And so I said, well, I mean, I don't think they would, but let's check the hotel. Maybe we can get in early. And so we pull up to the hotel, and Todd prays and says, God grant us favor. Now, my skeptical nature inwardly rolled my eyes and said, yeah, right. And so I go in and I say to the clerk, "Um, we have two rooms uh, for tonight, and I know it's early, and the check-in time's not till four. Is there any way we can get into our rooms early? And she looked and she said, yeah, no problem. I said, maybe you don't understand. We're asking to get in now. She said, yeah, yeah, let me run your keys. And I am thinking, this is amazing. Now, you might might hear that and you say, well, that's just luck. Maybe. And if we hadn't got the rooms, would that mean that God wasn't at work? No. It's just one small sign of God's grace, which is one more reason for joy. We got in our rooms, separate rooms, because I don't sleep in the same room as Todd. I brushed my teeth, I laid down for a 15 minute power nap, kind of got off, shook out the cobwebs, helped me get through a day. It's grace. I wanna tell you, hearing, hearing my grandson laugh is joy. Feeding my cows is joy. Watching an eagle fly over the lake is joy. My first steps after knee surgery were joy, painful, joyful. Knowing my sins are forgiven is joy. Having the power to resist temptation is joy. Baptizing people is great joy. I love doing that. So how about praying with me, Heavenly Father, keep opening my eyes to joy. Now here's the second thing we can do. We can choose joy. I know this is a surprise and I still work at this. And that is you can actually choose your emotional state. You may have to work through some emotions 
but you can work to choosing joy. Now, the more you take care of yourself physically, emotionally, and spiritually, the better you will be able to choose joy. Spending time praising and thanking God increases your likelihood of growing joy in your life. Here's the third thing we can do. We can find a joy mentor. In 12 step groups, they often say, find someone who has what you want and invite them to be your mentor or your sponsor. My grandmother was probably the most joyful person I've ever known. She had known the pain of a cheating husband, abandonment by that husband. She'd had a hard divorce. And this is in the 50s when good Baptist ladies don't get divorced. Yet I can remember her saying the only talent God gave her was to love people. And she would sit on her front porch and pray for the people who drove by her house, even though she didn't know who they were. And she had a saying, it's not in the Bible, but it's good. She said, life will make you bitter or better. And she chose better, and she had joy. She had a sense of safety. Now, here's the fourth thing we can do, and this is awkward, and I didn't know how to say this any better. Unchoose joylessness. When I first read this idea from Dallas Willard, uh, he was saying that joy cannot be found in hurry. And it's true. You cannot be joyful when you're in a hurry. So unchoose the things that make you hurry. I see some of you looking at your spouse. I get that. Ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life, he said. This remains a challenge for me. Maybe your challenge is not being in a hurry, but let me tell you, joy cannot live where there is numbness, and joy cannot live in a relationship where you're used. Joy cannot live in anxiety. Joy cannot be lived, cannot live in avoidance. So you've got to unchoose joylessness. Okay, so Jimmy Buffett passed away last weekend. I love his music, but I really don't like his philosophy. Thinking that if you just have enough rum and margaritas, you're going to have a good life. Do you think that's really true? You see, I, I have seen people who've been wasted away in Margaritaville, searching for their lost shaker of salt. And I know the next morning they wake up with a hangover. And I've even known some people wasting away in Margaritaville who could barely make it outside the bar and then throw up in the parking lot. Now, fo no, folks, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having one margarita or two. I'm just saying that if, if something doesn't really bring you joy, why do you keep doing it? You know, I th that's part of Satan's lie with any addiction. Hey, do it this time, and this time it'll bring you joy. How many times do you have to do it before you realize it's not going to bring you joy? Now, if you're not a believer and you're listening to all this, you may be saying, okay, I get it. I need to have joy in my life. Do you really think Jesus can bring me joy? My conviction is you'll have a better shot with Jesus than anything else in life. And if you will just let me speak from a vantage of seeing a good bit of life, I've seen that to be true. I've seen people who've been very successful, didn't bring them joy. People with a lot of money, didn't bring them joy. Brought them happiness, didn't bring them joy. I, I've seen people, you know, really enjoy their beer, and eh, didn't bring them that much joy. I've seen people who really did a lot um, in terms of sexual pleasure and yeah, joy for a moment or happiness for a moment, but not real joy. It's kind of an emptiness. So, so if you've not yet embraced Jesus, I think he's your best shot at joy. And you can connect to him by starting a relationship by saying, I am a sinner and I need Jesus to forgive me. So Jesus, take control of my life and forgive me, and I want this joyful life. It's a journey. You're not going to get there overnight. I will tell you something interesting, because you heard earlier about lake baptism. 
I, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I've baptized a lot of people. I have never yet seen the person who got baptized who was depressed about it. Never. It's a joyful time, and if that's your next step, I really want to encourage you, take advantage, let's do late baptism. You're going to rejoice. We're going to have a party that day. We're going to bring food trucks because we're Baptists to the baptism. So, okay, the overarching idea, you get this. Find joy in Jesus. Paul said rejoice in the Lord, and if you focus correctly on Jesus, the joy will increase. So let's commit to be a church of joy. Can we do that? Yeah, we're, we're going to go through some tough times as a church, and can I be honest with you? I think that, that some of the tough times we've gone through, is, it, it comes from the dark forces of evil that don't want good things to happen in anybody's life and not in Jesus' church. But let's resolve that we are safe in the arms of our Heavenly Father. And our Heavenly Father God has us, and we can't control the world, but God can. A pastor friend I knew, um, not really a friend, but an acquaintance, wrote a great book, and he said, I remember the day I found joy. It was the day when I resigned for being, from being responsible for the world. To followers of Jesus, every one of us, find joy in him. Because this is the life God wants for you to have. And I just want to leave you with this question. What would happen if you had a joyful life? What would happen if you had a joyful life? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, um, let me begin by, by praying on behalf of all of us who are followers of Jesus. Now, sometimes I know that I am not real good at this, Father. So I really do pray for people who are like me and for many who struggle to find joy that you would remind us that this is your command to choose joy. And we'll find it in Jesus. And Father, for those who really, this is natural, it's almost like a gift to them, they're able to find joy, help them to be mentors, sponsors for the rest of us. Help us to be a church of joy and trust you and live in the safety of knowing that we're in your loving arms. And I pray for people who have not yet embraced Jesus. And God, I have a hunch they may just have a loose, just tenuous attachment to you but they need to go ahead and solidify that relationship today. And I pray they would, that people would, would confess sin's reality to you and that they would turn to you and embrace grace. And I pray that people would get to know the joy of being baptized. Make us people of joy. That's what you want us to do. And we can only have it in Jesus' name. It's in his name we pray. Amen.